So I am asked to speak on advances in medicine. Medicine is a very vast subject, isn't it? So how can one cover advances in medicine in a short time? It is not possible. So what we have to do is we have to filter and come to areas of primary importance. What are the areas of primary importance for us? These five are the primary importance. Because why? 50% of the mortality and 60% of the morbidity in human beings is due to these five diseases. Due to these five. And underlying heart failure means underlying causes and dyslipidemia, obesity, hypertension, diabetes. All other diseases put together, they, they, are, they form the remaining 40-50%. So if we have covered this five, we would have covered around 50% of medicine. So let's see that. Let's see the diabetes first. So what are the recent things in diabetes? When I go into recent things, I assume that all of you have a good background knowledge about the disease already. That is a presupposed condition. On top of that only, we are trying to build it. So something like already a known audience, they're speaking to informed audience. Internet intervention for lifestyle modifications in diabetes is a new area. That means if you want to use the lifestyle as a, uh, as a sort of tool to modify the control of glycemia and make them you glycemic, now we have got several internet-based intervention, intervention tools. One should know how to use those tools. What I did was I gave you references at the end. You can go through those references and you yourself can find out that there is an internet-based intervention strategy for lifestyle modifications in diabetes. What are the lifestyle modifications? Weight control, physical activity, cessation of smoking. Okay? and reduction in alcohol, reduction in dyslipidemia, reduction in abdominal obesity, and going away from sedentary lifestyle. All these are the lifestyle modifications. I am not going to discuss those things, but I am going to give a pointer that there are resources available today on the internet for intervention for lifestyle modification in diabetes. Another approach is what is called the nanomedicine. So nanotechnology has come into place in almost every sphere of life. Nano is smaller than the, you know, millimeter, millimeter, micrometer, and then nanometer. Millimeter, micrometer, then nanometer. That is the smallest size that we can think of as particles. And today we are, we are preparing insulins and such small particles which can be delivered without an injection. What you can do? You can put the device here and then press it with your uh, sort of index finger through the skin pores, the nanoparticles go inside. And this is very a great boon because it is painless and patient's acceptance will be very good. This is a non-invasive approach to insulin delivery. Whatever is the insulin, the container is the same. The content can be a regular insulin, can be a sort of long-acting insulin, can be a recombinant insulin, whatever is the thing. So that is the second advancement in diabetes. The third one is inventive diabetes medicine diagnosis. So this is what we are going to do is not to look at the blood sugar for the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus. But we are going to detect the immune cell activity in the beta cell. <clears throat> so in the beta cell, we are going to look at the immune cell activity. After all, the diabetes mellitus, either type 1 or type 2, is either immune or non-immune destruction of the beta cells. So we keep, pick up the beta cell activity by using diagnostic techniques to detect the immune cell activity in the beta cell. This is a newer advancement for the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus rather than looking at a point blood sugar. This beta cell mass 
as the age goes by the time diabetes is detected 50% of the beta cells have apoptosed have died the difference between apoptosis and cell death is in apoptosis the cell is alive anatomically histologically but it is functionally dead whereas in cell death it is both dead functionally and structurally also this is what is called apoptosis so we can now find out in an individual what is the beta cell capacity uh, looking at the detection of immune cell activity in diabetes now this is the most important aspect of diabetes is not the height of the blood sugar but the fluctuations of the blood sugar this is called glycemic variability glycemic variability can be easily assessed by cgm continuous glucose monitor most of you would have seen they will wear a device here for 15 days and this device senses the uh, from the subcutaneous blood circulation it senses the glycemic level and gives us as a as a report and that report the clinician uses or the patient uses the trigger the amount of insulin required now under the cgm we have got automated devices also where the machine itself will decide what is the level of the blood sugar how much insulin has to be released whereas in the semi automated one only the report is is fed to the individual the individual triggers the number of units six units or five units by an ir gun so this is the cgm now there are, there are three components in the sensing device what are they the detector then the transducer and then a reporter these three are integrated into the sensing device the detector transducer and reporter now there are what are called the micro computer closed loop nano pumps looks very fascinating what will happen is we introduce a nano pump into the subcutaneous tissue of the person and this particular nano pump receives information through a micro computer closed loop about the day to day hour to hour minute to minute fluctuations of blood sugar and the nano pump delivers the nano particle insulin why it is called nano pump not that the pump is of the nano size pump is regular bigger size only maybe 2 by 2 cm but the particles of insulin or nano particles the advantage is you can load more amount of insulin under the pump and it will have a longer life span for the pump to be useful and requires changing very infrequently this is another new advancement then there is what is called the medical nutrition therapy we no more call it as diet 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 word is gone we have to say medical nutrition therapy with the design of signature diet strategies signature diet strategies means you take a person take his uh, habits take his uh, vegetarian or non vegetarian whether he has three meals a day or four meals a day what is the age of the patient depending on that the medical nut nutrition therapy is still tailored by the computer based programs and the strategies are applied to have euglycemia this is called signature diet these are all new words remember internet intervention for lifestyle nano medicine approach in di diabetes in, in inventive diabetic diagnosis using beta cell activity as the marker glycemic variability you know and then the micro computer based closed loop nano pumps medical nutrition therapy with design of signature diet and most importantly gene therapy and diabetes so here the gene therapy has got we don't uh, really add new genes to the genome we edit the existing genes and modulate their uh, their phenotype and expression this editing and modulation is done mostly by viral vectors so whatever gene we wanted to modify we will codify in the viral vector and the viral vector just you would have known in covid you know viral vector based uh, vaccines that that is one shot and then it goes and it enters into the genome of the individual and starts multiplying 
and produces genes which are edited favorably for the diabetes. This is called genotene therapy for diabetes with editing. Of course, there is stem cell therapy for diabetes also, pancreatic transplantation and preferably islet cell transplantation is a very useful thing, particularly in type 1 diabetes. Islet cell transplantation and pancreatic transplantation and in people who are uncontrolled diabetes, prolonged diabetes with complications, stem cell therapy has a place. Now, remember that point number 8 and 9 are not on the bedside. They are on the bench. Bench to the bed. Bench to the bed means in from the lab to clinical application. So stem cell therapy particularly more as a bench research rather than a bedside treatment. These are some of the latest advances. Now regarding treatment, are there any advances? Tirgepatide. It's a new drug which is approved by FDA, an injectable drug given under the skin once in a week. Tirgepatide. What is this? This is a glucagon-like peptide, glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide called GIP. This is more a combination of GI, GLP and GIP. And in an in a, in a injectable form for a prolonged delivery. That's why once in a week is sufficient. GLP-1 receptor antagonist semaglutide is also available. The semaglutide is compared against the standard insulins, the recombinant insulins like degludec and then glargine and found to be much more effective. The semaglutide is also a GLP-1 receptor antagonist. This is also you have to give subcutaneous. This is the drawback of the first two, tergepatide and then the semaglutide. Nonetheless, they are very efficacious and useful. Then we have got LDX. What is LDX? Ladarexin. Ladarexin is the another drug. The beauty of this is, this is an oral drug. Ladarexin is an inhibitor of the interleukin-8 receptors. Interleukin-8 receptor is responsible for beta cell damage and that is responsible for hyperglycemia and dysglycemia. If we interleukin-8 receptor antagonist inhibitor, if you want to use, if you use it, then interleukin-8 activity is reduced with the result that the glycemia is improved. This is an old movement, novel approach. LY3502970, before anything is available in the market, in the phase 1 and phase 2 trials, it is given a number. That is the number. It is a partial agonist towards the G protein activation or the beta arrestin recruitment at the GLP-1 receptor. So you know the GLP-1 receptor. In the GLP-1 receptor, there is an area called the G protein area. That G protein area over the beta arrestin recruitment is the one which is agonized. If you agonize the G protein activation, it is that means if you stimulate that, the beta arrestin recruitment is more so much so the GLP-1 receptor is stimulated and then produces more insulin in the periphery. This is another novel partial agonist that is being tried, not at available for clinical use. Now, there are several drugs which are being tried. Why give medicine once the di diabetes comes? Why not I prevent the beta cell apoptosis itself? Why, what is the reason why beta cells are apoptosing? Why don't I preserve the beta cells by giving, preventing the beta cell apoptosis is a novel concept. For that, we know that beta cell apoptosis can be prevented by anakendra, which is a drug used in rheumatoid arthritis. Likewise, TNF-alpha antagonists, interleukin antagonists are drugs which are helpful for beta cell apoptosis. Then, there is another important thing is need for optimal metabolic glucose regulation, blood pressure regulation, body weight correction, and improvement in the medical nutrition therapy and physical activity. Whatever you do, the treatment is focused not only on the glycemia, but also on blood pressure, on body weight reduction, 
an improvement in the medical nutrition therapy and promoting physical activity. So what did we learn? Tirzapatide, an injectable once a week drug, which is a GLP-1 like peptide and GIP-1 combination. It's a combination of both GIP-1 and GLP-1. Then other GLP-1 receptor agonist is semaglutide. It is in trials. It has proved better than the, the recombinant insulins. This, these two are subcutaneous. Ladarixin is an oral drug, which is an interleukin-8 receptor and inhibitor. And we have the newer drug LY3502970 is a partial agonist of the G protein activation over the BRS10 recruitment region uh, in the beta cell uh, GLP1 receptor. So that's also very promising. Drugs that arrest beta cell apoptosis are also being tried. These are anakindra and tumor necrosis alpha antagonists. So ultimately, we have to optimize metabolic regulation of the glucose, blood pressure control, and then body weight, improvement of MNT and the PA. I call it as ABC. A is A1C control, B is blood pressure, C is cholesterol, and D is, of course, your diet. E is exercise. A, B, C, D, E. A, A1C control, B, blood pressure under target, C, cholesterol are under target, and, uh, and then D for the diet. We don't more, no more call it as diet, we call it as MNT, and of course, we don't call exercise, we call it as physical activity. Okay, this is the advances I have covered in diabetes. I will go to the second one for the management of see, newer drugs in the obesity management. Earlier, we were short of drugs for obesity management. We were not having many drugs except overly stat. We used to have Rimanobant and other drugs earlier. They are because of side effects, they have been banned. Now I am left with very little options. Luckily, there are newer drugs coming up, what is called the metrileptin. You would have heard the word leptin, which is an important hormone in the control of obesity, a positive anorexogenic hormone to control the diabetes. Metrileptin is an analog of leptin, which is an injectable drug used once in a day. So it's very useful and under trials it has been found useful and approved by the FDA. Set melanotone, set melanotide. You know melanocartin, melanocartin-4 receptor agonist, melanocartin-4 receptors are anti-obesity, anti-diabetic too. Anti-obesity, anti-diabetic effect is due to the melanocartin-4 receptor activity. This melanocartin-4 receptor agonist given subcutaneously is called set melanotide. Melanotide, melanocartinsetide. Set means it sets that. That's why it is called the set melanotide. Orlistat, a newer drug which is a sort of lipase inhibitor, both in the gastric level and at the pancreatic level. It is available as Genical, Ali and many other brand names in India. Orlistat is time tested. But only thing is you will have a greasy stools for the patient and the benefit of weight loss is rather marginal. Now we have got a beautiful combination of fentramine and topiramate. topiramate. Fentramine, fentramine topiramate combination. Fentramine is a noradrenaline agonist and topiramate is a GABO agonist. And then these two together, they are antagonists to glutamate. The net result is weight loss. So it's a approved drug and it has to be given for a period of 16 to 24 weeks. And then uh, depending on the response, you can double the dose and use it for a for an year. Neltrexone, bupropion combination. These are opioid receptor antagonists and they act on the dopamine noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors. These are dopamine and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, naltrexone and bupropion. Liraglutide and semaglutide, you know, are GLP-1 antagonists. They not only have uh, sort of uh, glucose lowering activity, they are having uh, an advantageous effect of 
reduction in the weight. So liraglutide and semiglutide are first line drugs for obesity management also in spite of the person may be euglycemic. If he is diabetic anyway you can give even if he is euglycemic, liraglutide and semiglutide, GLP-1 analogs can be used. Now, tirzepatide we have already seen in the previous slide. This is approved for diabetes. This is a GIP GLP-1 dual antagonist. This is now being approved for obesity management also. Not yet received the FDA approval, but other agencies have already approved. Now, how, how am I tackling obesity management today? Action based on the incretins, centrally acting drugs, those drugs which reduce the appetite, those which increase the satiety, the feeling of fullness, and secondarily, those which prevent the absorption through the GI tract or those which increase the gastric emptying, that is the propulsion of food. Most importantly, all these thing, drugs should be cardiac favorable. Then only we can use them because ultimately the control of diabetes or the control of obesity is to have a better healthy heart. If these drugs do not have a positive profile on cardiac front, they cannot be used. Now I am repeating here on this slide, metrileptin, leptin analog, injectable, set melanotide, melanocotton 4 receptor agonist used subcutaneously, orally stat, time on our drug, and pancreatic and gastric lipase, fentyramine and topiramate combination. These are noradrenaline and GABA agonists and glutamate antagonists. Naltrexone and buprepione, opioid receptor antagonists, stimulate the reuptake of the dopamine and noradrenaline, and then they are, they, they are favorable for uh, sort of weight reduction. Liraglutide and semaglutide, which are GLP-1 analog or first-line drugs for diabetes management, are also useful for obesity reduction. Tirgepatide, a newer GIP GLP-1 dual antagonist, is approved for diabetes, is being under approval for uh, obesity also. Now, in the next slide, you can see various places where these drugs act. I'm just going to try to enlarge it if possible. It's not enlarged. Anyway, you just see that. So there are certain drugs, the GLP ones, the red marked ones act in the gut and the pancreas. Naltrexone and bupropione, they are in the green areas of the brain. And fentyramine and topiramate, the blue squares on the in the brain. Orlistat in the stomach. And then GLP-1, GIP dual antagonists in the pancreas and in the adipose tissue. So the in nutshell, GLP-1 receptor antagonists act on the GI tract. Naltrexone, bupropione, they act on the central nervous system. Fentramine and topiramate act, act on the central, but there is no peripheral action. Orlistat is a gastrointestinal tract. GIP, GLP-1 dual antagonists. They act on the adipose tissue and gastrointestinal tract. So these are the sites of action. If you see, I'll share this PPT with you. If you closely see the areas of the brain, you will know where exactly these drugs act on the central nervous system. Now let me go to the third topic, <coughs> which is recent drugs and dyslipidemia. Dyslipidemia means what is the cornerstone of treatment? Statin therapy is the cornerstone. Standard treatment for lowering LDL cholesterol, either in first degree primary prevention or in the secondary prevention. What is primary prevention? Primary prevention means it does not have any other disease except dyslipidemia. And I give this drug to just reduce the cholesterol. Secondary prevention is he is already a diabetic, he is an obese man, he has got cardiac disease, he has got myocardial infarction, and statins are given for secondary prevention. But both of them, LDLC is a crucial role in atherosclerosis. What are the newer drugs that are available? PCSK9 inhibitor. PCSK9 is a serine protease. The serine protease, what it does, it decreases the 
<coughs> removal of LDL from the system. Once the PCSK9 is active, the LDL removal from the system or the LDL catabolism is affected and LDL extraction from the body into the bile is reduced. With the result, the LDL will increase. Now, our PCSK9 inhibitors inhibit the serine protease. They increase the removal of LDL, increase the turnover of the LDL. They increase the LDL capturing receptors, LDL, LDL-CR. These receptors are more exteriorized and then exos exocystic of the LDL-C receptor suckers and the serine protease activity is, uh, is decreased by the PCSK9 inhibitors. So much so LDS is cleared from the body and that results in plug stabilization. You know, unstable plugs are responsible for various cardiovascular events, thus modifying the disease. This is a disease modifying drug, not only cholesterol reducing drug, this is a DMR. This is modifying treatment. Okay. PCSK9 inhibitors are the current treatment of dyslipidemia for those who do not respond to statins or who have a pressing need to arrest the atherosclerotic process. If there is an aggressive atherosclerosis in a young man, even if the cholesterol levels are borderline or relatively less raised, PCSK9 inhibitors are the treatments of choice. For other people, of course, statins are. Then I have got BA. What is BA? BA is Bempedioic acid. Bempedioic acid. Bempedioic acid. It inhibits the ATP citrate lyase. Ly ly what is ATP citrate lyase? There is a lyase, ly the one which, which lyases the ATP citrate. If the ATP citrate is lysed, acetyl coenzyme A formation is reduced. If the ATP citrate is more, more acetyl coenzyme A. You know, acetyl CoA is the central molecule for the cholesterol ring. So, for any steroid ring to be manufactured, including the cholesterol ring, acetyl CoA is the central molecule. If you reduce the ATP citrate ly 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 lyase, and then acetyl coenzyme A is reduced with the result LDL. The structure is not able to be formed and there will be a restriction in the formation of the, the cholesterol ring and that reduces the LDL. Another one is Inclisiron. Inclisiron. The name itself suggests S-I-R-A-N. S-I-R-A-N is Siron. Siron is uh, uh, S-I-R-N-A, you know, this RNA, S-I-R-N-A, small interfering RNA caught SIRNA in Clisiron targeting the 3 UTR of the PSK9 mRNA and then 2 years, once in 2 years you can give. Sorry, twice in a year you can give. The advantage of in is this drug can be given once in 6 months. What it does? It goes and interfere with, interferes with the, the SIRNA which are necessary for the manufacture of PSK9. We know how to inhibit PSK9 through the inhibitor. Now this is the engineering way, genetic engineering way of interfering with the RNA of the PS, PSCK9, mRNA. And the advantage is twice in a year injectable. So very easy for cholesterol management, take one injection in January, again July you take. You're done, you don't have to do it. Take every day tablet. Liver X receptor antagonists, also called LDX receptor antagonists, these are how do they work? These are transcription factors. There is what is called the reverse cholesterol transport. What is the forward transport? You eat the food, cholesterol is absorbed, gets into the system, goes to the liver, distributed to various organs where cholesterol is required for synthesis of your adrenal hormones, synthesis of your sex steroids, and cellular membrane integrity, cholesterol is required. But if it is more and the LDL subcomponent is more, it is dangerous. So that LDL subcomponent is policed by a police officer called the HDL. This HDL fellow, whenever the LDL is lurking on the vascular endothelium, you have no business to be here. Go to the 
uh, go, go to your uh, you know adrenals go to the sex glands go to the cell structure don't lurk on the endothelium it will pick up that fellow and then take it back and put it in the put him in the bile for excretion this is what is called the reverse cholesterol transport this drug favorably increases the reverse cholesterol transport the excess ldl lurking in the vascular endothelium is taken back and dumped in the into the liver and through the bile it is excreted and it also has chi action in absorbing the cholesterol it or it blocks the absorption of cholesterol in the gi level so it's a dual advantage now we got pa p par beta and p par delta okay p par beta and p par gamma we know p par gamma <coughs> the, our uh, standard drugs used for diabetes the p par receptors the, the glitazones are p pars they act on the p pars p pars are special nucleotide nucleotide molecules right? so where they act on the nuclear uh, material there and the peroxisom proliferator activator receptor ppar these p pars are two types beta and and then p par p par delta and these two p par gamma we know for the diabetes p for beta p for delta agonist siladelpha this is another drug called siladelpha which is favorable for dyslipidemia angioprotein like proteins agp like proteins they are also inhibited agp like proteins enrich the atherosclerosis and they produce angiopoietin this angiopoietin increases the neovascularization and angiogenesis and atherogenesis there are drugs which inhibit the angiopoietin like proteins and then we got mipomarasin which is another newer drug called mipomarasin and then we have lomipetide another drug and we have also got c3 inhibitors so c3 c that this is a lipoprotein c lipoprotein c has got several components c1 c2 c3 like that the c3 inhibitor apo c3 c3 is a component of ldl and sldl and uh, the lipoprotein a so if apoprotein c3 is inhibited by volnersen volnersen naturally it has got a favorable effect on the atherosclerosis see how many new things are coming now pcs can inhibitors serine protein is decreased removal of ldl is promoted plaque stabilization disease modifying current treatment for uh, aggressive atherosclerosis and statin uh, cholesterol not controlled by statins pcsk9 inhibitors of the current treat ba or bempedoic acid it increases the atp citrate lyase lyase thereby decreases the acetyl coenzyme a and thereby decreases the ldl synthesis inclisiron which is sirna targeting the utr region of the psk9 mrna advantage is twice in a year you can give and it it inhibits the psk9 liver x receptor antagonists are transcription factors that act in the reverse cholesterol transport to to take away the the bad cholesterol ldl cholesterol lurking on the vascular endothelium back into the liver and it has got a gi action also p par beta p par delta antagonists or seldel seladelpha is there and angiopoietin like proteins these regress the atherosclerosis these angiopoietin like proteins are inhibited by a mechanism drugs are being developed mipomarasin lomipetide and volanisoracin is a apo3 apo3 inhibitor now we go to the actions this diagram when i share it with you you can see in which particular part of the body in and in the liver these particular drugs act for example the psk receptor drugs are for the recycling here and then the bp is for the this is the bp where it acts then you have got angiogenesis prevention here like that every area is marked here this is too small print i would like you to look at the presentation now we have got recent drugs in 
hyper tension. Fortunately or unfortunately, lot of research in diabetes, lot of research in obesity, lot of research in dyslipidemia, very slow progress of newer molecules in, in hypertension. But there's a lot of reworking of the existing molecules to make a better control of hypertension. Now, what are the areas of recent advances in hypertension? Digital and health technology for diagnosis and monitoring. Now, what, what does that mean? You would be knowing now, watch it show blood pressure. People have got home BP monitors. People have got finger BP monitors. You have a just like your, you know, your oximeter. You wear it just for two minutes. It tells you this. These are digital technologies to diagnose and monitor hypertension. Definition of hypertension is being revised and establishment of treatment targets. Lot of work is going on. Today, whom I should treat? Anybody whose blood pressure is more than 140 by 90, irrespective of comorbidity. Even if he does not have any other comorbidity, he is a candidate for diet treatment followed by medical treatment if necessary. Who is 140 by 90? Reduce sodium, increase physical activity, reduce weight, stop smoking and coffee, watch for two months, not controlled, start on the drug. Now, anybody whose blood pressure is 130 by 80 or more, if he has got atherosclerotic vascular disease, like ischemic heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, heart failure, renovascular disease, peripheral arterial disease, you must treat him even if he is 130 by 80. This is today's recommendation. How do I go about it? Lifestyle measures, weight reduction, sodium control, smoking, ethanol control, caffeine restriction is a new addition to the research of hypertension. Caffeine is known to increase blood pressure and physical activity. What is the new catchword in hypertension? Chronotherapy. What is chronotherapy? Overwhelming prognostic impact on nocturnal blood pressure. If you have blood pressure in the daytime, no problem. There is what is called nocturnal dipping that occurs. That means 10 to 20 millimeters drop in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure occurs in the night. If somebody does not dip, it means he is in for a cardiac blood. How do I know that? By doing a sort of 24 hour BP monitoring, we can identify the nocturnal dippers or non dippers. Now, the chronotherapy focuses on the fact that we need to have a lower blood pressure to all the organs for them to recharge during the night. So I have to dose any antihypertensive in the night and not any time of the day except diuretic. Except diuretic because it can interfere with the sleep, frequent urination, all other antihypertensive drugs must be prescribed as a rule only in the night time after dinner. This is to reduce the night blood pressure and thereby improve the cardiovascular outcomes. More frequent use of mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. MR antagonists is there. Are your spinal actins. These have to be more used if the hypertension is resistant hypertension or secondary to some underlying cause. 95% of hypertension is essential hypertension or primary hypertension. 5% of the hypertension is secondary hypertension, means there is a secondary cause, either an adrenal cause or adrenal medullary cause or a renal cause or there is a polyarthritis nodosa or there is a coarctation of hyota, there is some other cause which is causing the hypertension. Such cases. Mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist will come a handy in dealing with this. Then we have got endothelin receptor antagonist, endothelin 1 receptor antagonist. Neprilicin is another novel drug which is used in heart failure along with the ARPs, which is also useful here with the angiotensin receptor blockers, ARBs. Then we know SGLT2, we have drugs which interfere with the SGLT2 receptor in the kidney. So SGLT2 receptor 
blockage will lead to glycosuria and reduction in the this one there is what is called a co-transporter co-transporter means sodium glucose co-transporter sodium and glucose are co-transported both in the intestine and at the kidney level in the proximal convoluted tube if you have a SGLT2 co-transporter inhibitor you not only achieve a control of sugar diabetes you also achieve a control of the sodium disease so when uh, so if, so when glucose is not absorbed back because of the inhibition sodium is co-transported sodium is also not absorbed sodium loss reduces the hypertension this is how the sglt2 co-transporter inhibition works and finally you have got renal denervation rd stands for renal denervation in refractory patients with secondary hypertension or malignant hypertension you can do wonders by the renal denervation just to type in the google videos for renal denervation you can see how renal denervation is done by animated videos so again just like glycemic control blood pressure variability glycemic variability is crucial blood pressure variability is also central for all cardiovascular outcomes means what there is let's say an individual a is there whose blood pressure is 170 by 100 constantly another individual is there whose blood pressure is 180 by 110 120 by 80 130 by 90 150 by 98 like that it is varying he has got poor cardiovascular outcomes so how do i know that by doing 24 hour bp monitoring and see the variability the variability is more you have to use drugs in such a way that the variability is controlled then you may require drugs which you use in the night and also in the daytime and balance the variability in such a case combination of ac or arb along with calcium channel blockers comes very handy like you know the novel calcium channel blockers are there <clears throat> you may not have used nifedipine you can use the latest generation uh, calcium channel blockers coupled with uh, your telmisartan or uh, or erbisartan or any of the ARBs. So this is to reduce the BP variability. So what are the important things in hypertension? Digital technology for diagnosis and monitoring, hypertension and establishing the targets. Remember 140-90 is the target when there are no comorb comorbidities. 130-80 is important when there are cardiovascular existing comorbidities are there. Lifestyle measures like weight, sodium, smoking, ethanol, caffeine, physical activity. Chronotherapy, try give the drug in the night and prefer only nighttime dosing, except diuretics. More frequent use of mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists and ER antagonists, endothelial 1 receptor antagonists, bosentan and other group of drugs. Neprilicin along with ARB, SGLT2 co-transporter which interferes with both glucose and sodium at the renal tubular level so much so there is glycemia is reduced and sodium burden also is reduced finally renal denervation remember just like glycemic variability bp variability is central to the cardiovascular outcomes out of the five topics diabetes obesity dyslipidemia hypertension we are left with heart failure now heart failure can be acute can be chronic can be systolic failure can be diastolic failure can be right sided failure can be left sided failure decreased ejection fraction heart failure preserved ejection fraction heart failure that is ejection fraction is normal which is called diastolic heart failure decreased ejection fraction heart failure is called the systolic heart failure we know we don't call them as systolic and diastolic now we call them as reduced ejection fraction heart failure and preserved ejection fraction heart failure so we need to know how to diagnose them these are standard methods of diagnosing and treating now what are the drug advancements i'm going to focus conventional treatment with ac and arb is the first aline antihypertensive drug either you use ramipril isinopril <clears throat> peridopril these prills or the sartans irbisartan candy sartan valsartan telmisartan losartan these are the air diuretics 
second important thing and particularly in the young non diabetics beta blockers particularly a not exclusive antihypertensive drug if there is an indication for beta blocker then like a cardiac indication you have to combine that with the acerb de novo beta blockers are not the first choice and of course digoxin is the last one so beta blockers are very helpful once the heart failure is ni nih class 3 or class 2 uh, and class 1 and not in class 4 they have to be very careful first to reduce the nih class then introduce the beta blocker there also you have to use newer generation beta like metoprolol nebivolol like then these are the newer drugs that are used and carbidilol these are the drugs digoxin has gone to the last row when some of us were star students for heart failure treatment digoxin is the first treatment today the first treatment is aci or arb followed by diuretics if the if there is wet uh, heart failure that is right sided heart failure patient is edematic edematous and then beta blockers once you control the heart failure level and of course digoxin in refractory cases aldosterone receptor antagonist nepralysin with arb is the chosen drug when there is heart failure is not getting controlled with the conventional treatment hydrolazine isosorbate are also now good antihypertensive drug there is a newer antihypertensive drug called the nesiritide nesiritide is a chimeric natriuretic peptide you know the natriuretic peptide b natriuretic peptide a natriuretic peptide this natriuretic peptide the very role is to produce natriuresis that is excreting natrium natrium is sodium sodium excretory process that natriuretic peptide uh, this nesiritide increases the sodium loss from the body thereby controls the uh, the blood pressure ularitide 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 is both a natriuretic and also a diuretic if you want to use a diuretic and natriuretic ularitide comes very handy because it is both a diuretic and also a natriuretic direct renin inhibitors aliskarin is a direct renin inhibitor we know that renin angiotensin system hyperactivity is one of the main features of heart failure what are the three important things one thing is there is heightened ras activity in the body there is heightened sympathetic activity in the body in case of heart failure that is why you use beta blockers for the sympathetic activity as in the aci and arbc use for the renin activity and then the direct renin inhibitor saliskarin also used now we have got soluble gonilate cyclase activators the gonilate cyclase is a, a sort of mechanism by which the renin angiotensin system the angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2 are cleaved so if you want to reduce the angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2 you have to increase their cleaving then thereby the gonilate cyclase activators help uh, help in reducing the ras activity then we have got adenosine antagonists endothelin 2 anti one antagonists and inotropes are also now being used in the heart failure and there are newer drugs coming up cardiac myosin activator see cardiac myosin is the myofibril protein in the cardiac muscle and these activate and stimulate the cardiac myosin so much so there is a better contraction of the myosin filaments and better contractile capacity of the heart and better improvement in the systolic function of the heart and then reduction in the heart hysteroxine streskopin or other newer drugs which are also cardiac myosin stimulators there is another new drug called relaxin it is useful in diastolic heart failure systolic heart failure is the contractile capacity problem diastolic heart failure is heart is unable to relax if it is not relaxing the feeling in the diastole is impaired once the diastolic feeling is impaired next systolic output is reduced okay so you just remember systolic function is like you know uh, <clears throat> a fast bowler uh, vasimakram bowling very fast 
so that means that is a, this more a, like a, a, a an ability of the heart to uh, system I and mean, have a good compression of the ventricles and release the blood in the system diastolic heart, heart failure is like john t road is taking a catch so what he will do he will not go and uh, approach the catch and see wait and receive the catch in the hand properly and hold it so the heart has to receive carefully the blood by properly dilating that is a diastolic function if that is impaired diastolic heart failure factors so this is how this is summary of all the talk which i wanted to tell you my given time is around 45 minutes or 40 45 minutes i think we have completed all the important advances in the five diseases like diabetes mellitus dyslipidemia obesity hypertension and heart failure i told you that if you take care of these five diseases five groups of diseases we have taken care of 50% of the medicine for example if you look at renal failure and dialysis units 80% of people who for go for renal failure are either a diabetic or hypertension all other causes of kidney disease stand for 20% that's the importance of these diseases okay now these are the various references for each one i have selected one good reference there are five topics i have given you five references for further reading go there and read the details there because it is not physically possible to cover all the advances in a very detailed way in one session and thanks for giving me the opportunity